Thank you very much. And uh, of course, I'm also impressed by the number. While, uh, well, not exactly in Roman law, I was saying also to our chair, I will talk about exile generally in ancient Rome, like social considerations, political and legal considerations, because public Roman law was not exactly so developed as private law, and uh, because I shall make uh, reference to Ovid and Seneca, and uh, as far as they're concerned, so we have more literary uh, sources than legal sources referring to their exiles. When we re refer to ancient exile, some of the scholars consider that it is of the utmost importance to strictly distinguish between the political legal reality and the literary vision of the facts presented in the literary works. Nevertheless, as the sources that we have at hand, as I previously said, are not always purely historical or purely legal ones, but rather literary pieces of writing, a realistic approach of the situation reveals that a clear separation between the political, legal and social perspectives on exile cannot be properly realized. If we take, for example, Ovid's exile, we discover that most of the sources are his work. And we should not forget that Ovid's exile is still one of the most unsolved mysteries of the Augustan period. The same is for Seneca, when, where we can find information about his exile and about his vision on exile, moreover, on the constellation at Matrem Helvia. Where do, is this word coming from, etymologically? We have the ancient approach, because the ancients considered that exilium comes from extra solum, out of the sun, as Isidore of Sevilla says, exilium dictum quasi extra solum. And it is the approach that is also reflected in all of its work, because he feels that he is casted away in solitude, darkness, coldness, at the end of the world, out of the civilized world, he, is, um, he feels that only despair and sorrow over, surround him. And moreover, Thomas is for him a land surrounded by negative mythological significations, if we think of Medea and all the um, issues. Then he feels that he is extra mundi, or as he says, in extremis, or ultima telus, ultima terra, ultimus locus. So these are the words that he uses to refer to Thomas. And now I guess that you just uh, imagine why I've chosen exile, because I come from Romania, <laughs> and because Ovid was exiled there. At Thomas, today, Constanza. You should definitely visit it. It's, you should definitely <laughs> not let yourself influenced by Ovid. He was not exactly so right when he said all this, okay? <laughs> Believe me. Okay, what is about this exile and uh, exilium fuga? We have this, those two terms. We have exilium and we have fuga. Whilst today, the modern, nowadays, the modern term of exile means involuntarily leave of somebody from a place as a sanction imposed politically or legally. And for this, uh, for exilium, the Latins covered a broader semantic area where they included also the term fuga. It was also the influence of Greek. They did not distinguish between the two terms, using them in parallel. We have also in Cicero's Republica, we have with the same meaning the expression exilium camilli and fuga metelli at the beginning of the first, uh, first um, century after Christ. Not only, we had not only uh, the sanction itself of exile designed by this term, but also the place of the exile 
the refugiation, the voluntarily moving of somebody from one place to another in order to escape a sanction, in order to um, avoid a penalty, but what is essential is that was voluntarily, not imposed. Besides the classical Israel, I was saying that Ovid also used the term fuga and not with the meaning of voluntary isolation, but as a synonym for that involuntary leave that he suffers. We have ingenio sig fuga parte meo, that uh, my leave was uh, caused, my exile was caused by my talent, hanc odis exonerate fugam, quod vesit a patria tam fuga tarda veror, I am um, I'm suffering because my uh, leave from my uh, homeland is too is too quickly too quick I'm sorry and he calls himself a profuse with the sense of uh, exiled person as one of the earliest manifestations of human civilization, exile becomes gradually a social-political reality of antiquity, consisting of a conventional penalty applied by the ruler or by individual people who committed uh, on individual people who committed a crime, or as a means of providing a compensatory satisfaction for the victim's family. Subsequently, the punishment which involved exclusion from the community essentially extends, at least in archaic and classic Athens, on other crimes such as murder intent, cutting or destruction of sacred olive trees, guilty neutrality during wars, or um, aid to an exiled, sometimes also crimes of impiety. And, okay. In, uh, as far as Roman law is concerned, we have Olpianus that talks about exile and we have mentioned four types of exile. Relegatio, relegatio in insulam, interdictio acve et ignis and deportatio. We shall refer in uh, this paper on the first and the second. Relegatio is the punishment that Ovid is subject to in Eight for Christ and it was a type, generally, it was a type of temporary uh, ad tempus or perpetual, in perpetuum exile, that did not imply either uh, loss of citizenship or loss of the goods, seizure of the goods of the person that was uh, subject to this sanction. Relegatio in insulam, supposed in the year 41 after Christ, the year in which Seneca was exiled under Claudius, both the indication of a concrete place for the exile and the seizure of half of the exile's fortune. From a pecuniary point of view, we may believe that Seneca was a bit more affected, but he suffered less. Stoics have their, <laughs> have their own way of uh, seeing life. Let's see a bit about Ovid's exile. I mentioned at the beginning that it is still considered an unsolved political, literary issue, legal issue, we're not sure. There are so many theories on Ovid's exile and most of them come on from the interpretation of his work. He speaks about Carmen et error, the poetry and a mistake. Which poetry? Some say it's Ars Amandi, others consider that generally his Ars Poetica, his uh, vision on poetry is the problem because does not, um, is not um, in accordance with Augustus theory on the redivivus of morality. Augustus who was not exactly quite a saint when he was young, but under the influence of Livia, tried to, re, uh, to rebring morality in the Roman society. And we know that Augustus was a protector of arts, if we think of Horatius, for example, but in this particular case, 
he was <coughs> not only uh, cruel if, our, if we are to look at the Ovid's opera, but uh, also maybe a bit unfair. If, I mention again, if we look only at the poetical opera, only at Carmen. On the other hand, we've got error. What was exactly that error? We can only suppose. There are very many theories uh, that um, some of them are a bit uh, strange, other more realistic. There are so th those theories that uh, involved Ovid in some divination um, meetings where the future of Augustus uh, might have been uh, discovered that affected him and uh, drive uh, him a bit uh, nervous. And then this, it was the fact that uh, he might have seen the Empress uh, Livia getting out uh, of uh, the bath and uh, seen her naked, which might have attracted her fury. It is known, it is true, it is known that she was very hostile to Ovid, more hostile than Augustus, and uh, we incline to believe that Augustus was influenced by Livia. And this uh, issue is a bit supported by um, the reference that Ovid makes to Acteon in, in, uh, in his works, and he mentions, uh, he makes a comparison between him and Acteon. These comparisons are not, um, are not rare in his opera, in his, uh, in his works, because he also compares himself to Ulysses, but the comparison to Acteon um, made uh, many scholars believe that uh, it might represent a clue towards the real uh, reason of the exile. There, uh, I was mentioning the fact that um, he compares also to Ulysses. He creates in his poetry, in his Tristia and Epistola ex Ponto, a real myth of the exile and uh, he um, depicts all uh, the tragedies of his situation with poetical means. In this uh, situation yesterday when uh, Gilles uh, spoke about Ulysses and uh, <coughs> the punishment of the suitors, I was thinking a bit, well, if Ovid compares himself to Ulysses, how was he helped by Apollo? It was just... <laughs> Uh, what should have Apollo done in this case to help him? I guess he worked on the literary uh, sphere and uh, helped him uh, improve his inspiration and uh, remain in the memory of uh, posterity. A very different approach of exile we have at Seneca. Seneca sees exile as being positive for Seneca the universe is a whole and uh, that is brought to life by a corporal principle he calls celesti spiritus. Therefore, the intellect, uh, mens, or the ration of the soul, find its origin in this celesti spiritus. Illo celesti spiritu descendit. And has the same nature as stars or planets. And as planets, are in a continuous move on their orbits, the rational soul imitate on Earth their movement until the moment when he shall return to the origin. Celestium autem natura semper in modo est, fugit et velocissimo cursu agitur. Therefore, the human life is a journey that does not end in the material world, and the soul aims to join the universe, to enter in harmony of the universe. As such, According to Seneca, all the human beings are in a perpetual exile on Earth, as the mankind has a cosmic destiny. It's inspired by Empedocle and his um, vision on um, human destiny. And in the light of this, no place of exile can be 
better or worse than other because the exile does not have in itself something terrifying. We are naturally alienated from our cosmical identity. Therefore, we are in a perpetual exile. Ut lex et naturae necessitas ordinavit. Consequently, Seneca also discredits the idea of locum exilii, as I said, seen as a place of sorrow. It is on the totally opposite, um, on a totally opposite perspective than that of Ovid. We have here nullum in venere exilium intramundum potest, because it is just a logico mutatio, a change of place. The relativization of space is sustained by arguments that find their origin in the very ancient reality of the benevolent exile. Seneca mentions the foreigners attracted by the city of Rome, the unwelcoming Mediterranean islands that still attracted many, the colonization and migration phenomena that he calls public, publica exilia. Neither he intends to rely solely on his uh, personal experience. Being a stoic, practically Seneca um, reflects all his stoical philosophy in, um, in, this, uh, in this Consolatio Ad Matrem Helviam that he <coughs> speaks in that we, he speaks about exile. In the end, I shall talk a bit about the Christian tradition because in the Christian tradition, after the fall from paradise, the man is subject to a perpetual exile during his earthly existence. And thus, the fallen, the human beings being, aims for redemption and for the perfect harmony of God that cannot be reached during his mortal life. This lifelong exile can be therefore regarded from one perspective, with the Ovidian meaning, I may say, an involuntary isolation full of sorrow, as it is extra solum, the, the sun, that, uh, a metaphor for God, extra mundi, if we think of the heaven, or outside joy and perfection, shrouded in a continuous desire to enter the grace of the Creator. But, on the other hand, we may have in this Christian vision of the life as a perpetual exile, also uh, the, the, the other approach of the positive exile. And if you look um, at Paul, second epistle to the Corinthians, we've got, living in our bodies, we are, we are far away from God. Then, but, and he continues, explaining that uh, the life on earth is not necessarily um, a life of sorrow, but it, mu it must be a life of hope. Therefore, we have to be, um, we have to be, um, we not have to despair because our final destination is, uh, is one of hope. And in, in a Christian, uh, in a Marian hymn, Catholic hymn, we have also this exilium, it's Salve Regina, we have et Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tuis nobis post hoc exilium ostende. We have in a prayer the term of exile. It, it is clear that in Christianism the human being is seen as exiled on earth and of trying to reach again the perfection, the happiness, the joy. I welcome questions and I hope you did not feel quite exiled here. <laughs> Thank you very much.